good to have you all back to our Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture show. And we're broadcasting live from, once again, the opposite ends of the world, me here back to near Munich, and you, DeSoto, back in Honolulu, Hawaii. Hi, Hello, DeSoto. hi, everybody. So how are things out there? I think you have some bad news to share, right? Well, uh, as of tomorrow, from the day that we are broadcasting this, uh, we'll be back on a two-week lockdown again. And that means non-essential businesses will be closed. I will not be going into my job at Bishop Museum. And we'll be back to just the essential businesses of food stores and gas stations and things like that being open. So that makes what we are about to discuss very timely as we talk about spaces which are private yet open and more healthy because they have air circulation. Absolutely. Let's get up the first slide here because the last couple of shows uh, we have actually been doing from what we call working from home or home office or office home, however you want to call it. And here's uh, the three of us who have been doing shows together uh, the last couple of weeks, which is our friend Ron Lindgren and which is Yuta Soto and myself. And why don't you start out to explain your sort of um, homey circumstances, which we see at the very bottom? Well, these are pictures of the house that my fa my family's house, where my mother still lives at the age of 100. And it's an Ossipoff-designed home, and it's on the slopes of Diamond Head. So in these pictures, you see that there's an open space behind the house, which is the excavated part of the slopes of Diamond Head that forms one side, and then the other side is, of course, the house itself. So it's protected, and it is shady at certain times of day when it's hot, and this is functioning, functions as a very large courtyard. Mm -hmm. And it's a special tied one because you have a an, an man-made area on one side and a nature made one on the other side exactly while the right. picture at the top left is one of Ron's spaces and places that help him to survive the isolation that he keeps telling us he is in and he feels like being in and uh, and this is this is an impression from that and we will see more and talk more about that and have him back on the show because he has the work of his office to share in these circumstances as well and last but least in this case, on the top right is me, together with our exotic escapism expert Susanna, back in her what we ironically call the Department of Bavarian Homeland Development, where we aren't as privileged as you guys to have what seems increasingly important in these days of confinement, which is besides an uh, private indoor basis, which are increasingly problematic because of the lack of airflow, or public outdoor space, which is also increasingly problematic because you, you have a hard time basically controlling social distancing. So the thing in between, which is basically private outdoor space, we don't have, and we, you know, it's sort of getting to us. And uh, so next slide, while we're we're missing that, as um, here you can once again see, we have a little bit of a a deck there, a paved deck in front of the the, the 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 window doors, and we have a balcony, but we don't have any privacy. So once you're outside, you can be watched and heard and everything else by everyone, by all the neighbors. Uh, there is a typology that we already scratched on because you guys uh, are um, privileged to appreciate them and have them, which here Suzanne's youngest son textbooks. Uh, brings back to our memory because it talks about courtyards and they trace back as long as to the early Egyptians here where, and you know, I didn't make you to read the whole thing <laughs> as your weekly German lesson, but you picked up the most important thing and we learned from it that it was the rather well-off people who were enjoying the courtyard type and the more simple people were not having that and we're going to dedicate this show towards the end that we want to make up for that and for these days to try to find ways to particularly provide this seemingly uh, very important feature of a building also to the people at the lower end of the food chain. But yeah. that later. Uh, next slide. Um, 
We have been, again, sharing pieces, bits and pieces of our memory and history, not because it's about us, but we want to make you, the audience, think about what you experienced and how you grew up. And, and this picture here um, uh, amazed you to Soto, right? Yes, absolutely. Like that. Well, like what we that. see is an, an, an urban area on the right and a heavily forested area on the left. And as you pointed out, this city, this German city, has this natural environment of a, of a forest. But on the right side, all of the urban blocks have central courtyards. So the exterior boundaries are built on, and the interior is a, a vegetated open space. And so as you said, living in a place like that, you can go to the front of your apartment and look at the street if you want to, or you can go to the other side and look out onto nature, to an open space which the inhabitants of that block can use, including children. And it's really a combination of urban and natural. And of course, if you, with a, within a distance of a short walk, you can get into that big, huge forest on the left. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So these are courtyards on a large scale, on a macro scale. Yes. Along the street, on the on the interface of green and 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 red in that case, these are uh, brick tile roofs. We have seen one of these units from the inside because our Tiki basement bar expert uh, Stefan, my dear buddy, and and his wife Kirsten live in one of these. And so uh, let's go to the next slide and. Uh, make me share how I grew up because we were privileged because my parents were able to rent a prime piece in one of these blocks, which was the top unit uh, with a what we can call a sky lanai or courtyard. And at the bottom right um, is my father and me, my sister, in one of these at peak season of summer. Bottom left is when we moved on and my parents bought a townhouse that they remodeled. He also added uh, lanai is also one to the to the rooftop, which you can sort of see uh, glimpsing through the, the big tree there. Um, and at the top left is my parents right now and my father uh, lounging on yet another roof terrace at their location in Radeboil near Dresden these days. So this is a theme that, again, has been with us uh, throughout the history of our the family and and we've been enjoying that and 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 know the value of it which again in these days becomes so much more valuable because it's the place and space that actually keeps us the safest and the challenge of a global pandemic next slide um a couple more reflections on my childhood here um Right on the edge of that forest was a, um, a location of a trip I was able to every once in a while do when my father drove me to uh, a grandma's place of a, of a friend of mine. And there was another kid in the neighborhood who lived in a huge, and I couldn't find a picture of the original house, which unfortunately has been torn down. So I only uh, provided the A-frame house design that we were proposing over my sabbatical last year. He had a huge A-frame house and he was sort of a pioneer in fitness design, bodybuilding. His name was Curlbull or he's still alive. I Googled him. And he had, uh, again, all the fanciness of space age. We've been talking about the soda we had. Uh, he drove a Porsche 928, which I put in there. And his son had all these, you know, electronic whistles and bells, toys uh, that were blinging and making noises. And we were attracted to that. Next slide, opposite attracting, uh, we were the uh, more down-to-earth, literally and figuratively, uh, kids because we played with uh, uh, big Straßenkreuz, uh, American uh, cars, a miniature version of Matchbox in the sand in the garden of his grandmother. And it was really the coolest grandma ever. She was a painter. And she, she drove that uh, to you, probably not that familiar car, uh, which is the Fiat Panda at the top right, which was an entry-level car for the people, kind of like the bug, the Italian version of the bug. And she took out the, the passenger seat and put her 
painting equipment in there and drove out in the countryside. And in her yard, she grew vegetables and herbs, made everything from scratch. There was a parrot. There was a monkey there. It was like a jungle back here in Germany, quite unusual. And uh, Stefan actually went out to take these pictures for us. And the house still, uh, the grandma has died some while ago, but uh, the new owner hasn't really decided to renovate it. So it's, it's even more jungly as of these days. And this friend of mine, you see at the very top left, Stefan Severuk, and go to the next slide. And I've lost touch with Stefan and have to reconnect, so hopefully the show here helps me. But uh, Stefan had one big hit, one, one hit wonder back then, which you see the album here, which I was finding on the Internet. And uh, he was backed up by the friend of his mother at that time, uh, Michael Naua, who was a rather famous uh, jazz musician in Germany. And they exposed me to the greatest of American culture and music, you see Earth, Wind, and Fire. You see George Benson's guitar. And you see that Holly bald guy next to that black gentleman who was George when he was playing in Honolulu some years ago and was doing a book signing in Barnes & Noble. And I went there and had the chance to talk to my hero and share with him that he's one of the reasons I'm in his country. Uh, I let you talk about the, the last two pictures up there, the top right. Okay. So maybe, uh, Melissa, you can try to call the Soto again, and I will continue. The Soto said uh, to the picture at the, in the middle on the right that it looked like, and he had a, he tried to remember it was him in front of the Guggenheim with huge hair, but that was actually me. We both had huge hair. We don't have any, uh, hardly any hair left, I should say. And I was, again, a student in the U.S. at that time after Stefan encouraged me, and I went to school in Lincoln, Nebraska. As of now... Uh, uh, you know, DeSoto and I agreed before the show. Now we know better, especially that we got to know Ron and the fantastic work uh, of his firm. Uh, we believe he actually is the greater American architect than Frank. But then again, that's all subjective and up to your own opinion. DeSoto, great. You're back. We go to slide number eight. These pictures now, the following pictures have been done by Stefan, and this is the development right across the street from a grandma's house. And this is a rather confined, very dense uh, urban infill structure right at the edge of, of that forest here. And let's check this out a little closer. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, the author is... Uh, uh, Stefan and my professor, Friedrich uh, Spengelin, up there, and his uh, wife in, uh, in life and in business, uh, Ingeborg. And they did this development here. On the left, you see an architectural model that they attached to, the, to one of the walls in the community. And they were pioneering something that, as you told us, DeSoto, you will, and everyone else on the island will have to experience for the next two weeks, if not longer, is actually a home office. So they actually worked and lived in that community they designed. And let's go to the next slide. And uh, you please uh, share with me what impressed you uh, in, with these pictures. Well, you pointed out to me that this is a very complex development, but it has some very positive attributes. It has a single exterior corridor that we can see in the lower picture. It's got parking that's covered, which is also an amenity, but also something that I asked you about. This is something built in the 1970s, and so it's coming up on 50 years old, but it is still a very desirable place to live, and it's obviously still very well cared for. So this means that it is a successful place to live. People want to live there, and that is the real key, I think, to successful architecture. People want to be in it because of how wonderful it is. Yeah. And we can say, thanks, you're, you're dating it, and we can call this, this is a prime and fine piece of, uh, of tempered brutalism because it's from the yes. 70s. It majorly has exposed concrete, which is way more challenging as far as heat and cold, uh, you know, conducting, uh, and, and it, yes, it has been uh, maintained and retained pretty much in its original condition for the reasons of appreciation you mentioned, yes. Very much so. Next slide is showing us the circulation in the uh, more one-story part towards the street, which are very narrow paths. 
all, uh, only accessible by walking, and they have a very medieval kind of feel to them. And from them, next slide, you access uh, the individual, the individual unit. And there's some ferocity, there's some openness to the public, but it's also limited at the same time. And uh, next slide um, shows us what the theme of these couple of shows is, which is the soda. It's, it's courtyards. It's enclosed and yet open spaces. And the thing that is really remarkable that that I was questioning you about, and we're both intrigued by it, you can see, of course, there's the, the normal outdoor courtyard. You can also see the dining room that's got sliding doors that looks out into that courtyard that is open and yet private. But on the right-hand side, you see this really intriguing what looks like an interior room inside a bigger room. And we think that that is actually open to the sky so that that is an interior courtyard that is protected because, of course, this is a temperate, cold climate, so it's got glass and it's got good, robust, probably, insulation. And it looks like a very Japanese-style, Zen-style little view of just rocks and gravel, no plants, something that you can look at and contemplate, something that probably receives rain and probably receives snow, but and yet you are looking at it from the warmth and comfort of your interior space. Absolutely. And since the Asian culture has an even more bigger impact in, in Hawaii, yeah. you might as well, you know, look into the same inspirations yes. even more yes. than we have done in the past, which we will show a little later. So the next slide, uh, just confirming what, what you had just talked about, the very sort of Asian feel, while at the same time also very Scandinavian, which uh, Professor um, Spengelin took his students frequently. I, shame on me, never had, or I should say, took the chance to be part of one of his trips, but Stefan did. Uh, they went to Copenhagen and looked at the great examples of, um, of Scandinavian architecture, which gets us to the next slide. Um, which is a project we've been uh, featuring uh, before, which is, Soto? Well, it's that? your former home. And it's a, it's, that a, is true. it's an architecturally built home from the 1960s, and you lived there with your two sons and your former wife, and it, too, features courtyard spaces, interior private spaces, yet open to the elements. Absolutely, and... Joey and Clara had used it as a pit stop to build their shaved ice truck that we've been uh, featuring and been talking about. And at the top left, you see the brave boys basically uh, do maintenance in the courtyard and raking leaves here. <laughs> and at the bottom, you see its main courtyard, the garden space, and this is taken from the south. So this is a very environmentally friendly house built in the 60s, uh, passive solar, shorter ceiling glass. So... The low sun can eat up the space that we don't need in Hawaii, but what we need in Hawaii all the time is that gap, that overhang. And that is, as you can see in the picture, shades the glass wall very efficiently. So let's go to the next slide. And the next slide you see, uh, well, you see two pictures, and they both show the, the entrance courtyard. So once you enter the property, you were in a courtyard already, the one that the boys were raking. and maintaining kindly. Thank you, guys, retrospectively. And so uh, on the left was what we call the Little House. Interesting architectural background because um, one of our most prominent German architects, who then, as many uh, of them, uh, were welcomed by um, your country and the United States when they weren't welcomed in their original country, Germany, by Hitler and the Third Reich, uh, was Walter Gropius, and Walter Gropius mostly known for the Bauhaus that we will revisit again in a couple of shows briefly, um, has built one house in my hometown in Hanover, and the architect who owned my former house was doing the construction supervision himself being an architect. And he had never used what that part of the property was originally made for being a garage and added another part to it and used it as a home office. There we go again. Seeing that yeah. just, uh, you know, we're around already and become more and more relevant. 
Yes, next slide. And the little house itself had one additional courtyard that was, felt like two courtyards. So again, the courtyard theme was really, really multiply apparent uh, in, in, the, in the property. And we appreciated that a lot. Next slide. Uh, this is a courtyard of a different kind. This is an outdoor seating area where the roof, the sloped roof, continues and is not clad with a fiber cement uh, corrugation anymore, but with plexi corrugation. And then in front of it, it has a wooden lattice screen. Once again, as you said, very Japanese yes. style, right? Yes, very also much. Very Scandinavian and its materiality could be, yes. could be Alba Alto as well inspired. And yet you had another uh, intimate space that was protected from the element, but yet open to the fresh air that we need more than ever these days. Yes, we do. Next slide. And this was what we saw at the very beginning. The, the main courtyard is the garden. Space, so the largest courtyard, and again, a very Asian feel. I mean, this house could almost have been by Alfred Price in Honolulu. Right? Yes, from very from much so. Yeah, you know, this kind of seamless transition, blurred boundaries from inside out through yes. large panes of glass, and uh, uh, operable uh, windows, by the way, on top. So you got natural ventilation there. So next slide. And um, this is important because this has been part of the project from the very beginning. Uh, this is what we would call a strip mall in America. And in the 1960s, uh, this project being in the outskirts of town, which we would call suburbs, now the city has been growing and it gets more and more part of town, but back then it was pretty much out there. But very early they brought a light rail system, and we're saying, we put an emphasis on light because we're increasingly stuck with a heavy rail system that's under construction. So this is an on-grade system here that gets people out into this uh, neighborhood by public transportation, by a tram. And at the bottom, we also have commercial infrastructure. So everything you need for a daily basis, your bread and your, uh, if you want your ice cream here, there's a little ice cream store here. You do need ice cream. Yes, we do. You need ice cream. So you have that all there. And so that's, uh, that, as we were talking before the show, is another element, is another aspect that has been contributing to the appreciation. This project is even earlier. The, the other one was in the 70s. This one here is from the 60s. So very, very early, very forward thinking, uh, very sustainable, although the term wasn't even created. Right. Because you had everything that you needed in walkable distance. And, right. and these are really the keys to what we like to call buzzwordy sustainability, right? Yes, absolutely. And, um, and, um, and again, uh, the, 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 the kind of the, the search we're on about courtyards, the courtyard certainly had a large contribution to the success of, of these projects that, again, um, I experienced myself. Uh, one very personally, the other one from observation uh, from my professor. And um, I have to say, uh, not until now I really start, and that's uh, the mission of these shows, I, I really start to super appreciate that quality because, once again, we're all struggling for it, especially here uh, in, in, in Europe where, um, you know, it's getting cold pretty soon. I'm wearing, I'm not as naked as at the beginning in my childhood with, my father and my sister on the roof terrace, right? Because today was the first, the last day we jumped into a lake, uh, which is a public uh, uh, pool, and they're going to close the facility the next weekend because there's most likely not going to be any swimming temperature anymore. And then we know uh, we're going to be in trouble because we're going to be indoors. Yeah. And how do we basically get fresh air we can open the window, but the other big challenge for the for the world is is the environment, right? Yeah. So we can't just, you know, blow the heat out of our homes, um, and so we're we're really challenged here. 
Absolutely. And so again, um, but for Hawaii, where we don't have these conditions, we should really treasure and appreciate the private outdoor so much. When I'm talking to my students now online, they're all sitting trapped in their in their places and spaces, and I would wish they could all have, if so, a very small courtyard, yes. you know, private yes. uh, outdoor space that would absolutely so much help them. Absolutely. No, this is something that we I was talking about in the show that I did last week of the open space, the open air being absolutely crucial to controlling COVID because air movement, air temperature, humidity, all of those things help kill it so that it cannot live in the air and get into other human beings. The more we can be in the air, the more we can be in moving air, the better for us. And as you just said, we are blessed here in the Hawaiian Islands to be able to do that all year round and not be forced to be stuck indoors when it is cold and snowy, as most other parts of the world are going to be experiencing very soon. Yeah. And as we were appalled even before the pandemic when we see new projects going up that have no lanai's, oh we said it should be mandated by code and Hawaii to have yeah. lanai's. And yeah. probably for other developments, there are more... Uh, you know, fewer stories, probably courtyards might want to be mandated yes. as well, as there is such a great, um, you know, safety and sanity divide. Yes. Okay, um, I think we're on to something, and so let's continue for the next couple of weeks our we search for courtyards to inspire you, the audience, to please do the same and look out for courtyards that you find, that you hear about, that you might dream about and yeah. help making them reality. Right. All right. So with that, Soto and everyone else, please stay easy breezy and easy breezy, as we like to say. Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs>